and share a reflection. The title of the reflection is Freedom. Um, I imagine a man, I, I don't, you don't know in the narrative of the story, but I imagine a man in a dark room. As he's in that dark room, there's a candle, and that candle is really the only light that he has in that room. And his heart in this kind of beating in his chest, and he's, he's upset, and he's saddened, and he's heartbroken, and he's trying to put pen to paper, and he's trying to write. And, and in the time when he's trying to write, it's roughly 2,000 years ago, and so in that time when he's writing, paper is expensive. Amen? Just making sure we're on the same page. So he can't scribble, and he can't erase, and he can't cross out, and so he's formulating these thoughts in the middle of that picture, and I imagine that as he's in that room, that his, his body, ah, man, his body, fam, I imagine it's even hard for him to write, to grab a quill, to dip it in the ink, because his body has experienced so many adversities. His health is waning He's coughing, probably has a napkin close by because oftentimes he coughs up blood at this point. He's got scars all over his body from a life well lived, in his opinion, a race well run, in his opinion. All the times, imagine as he's writing just this one phrase that he's reflecting back on all the times where he said, you know what? I refuse to bow a knee to any system. I refuse to bow a knee to Rome. I refuse to bow a knee to the synagogue. I refuse to bow a knee to absolutely anything but Jesus. His body has been beaten numerous times, thrown in prison, thrown off a ship. And here he is in this room writing, trying to formulate a letter. It's his fourth letter to a church that he loves, a faith family that he loves, that he knows by name situated in the middle of this kind of super important space called Corinth, right in the middle of that where everything's coming and going, merchants are everywhere. He had spent 18 months with these people and had come back for a different visit and been away and tried to get back. He loves them. His heart is aching for them. And so he's trying to figure out how to be the most impactful with this letter, how to get this phrase right. Because see, what had happened was the church, the people that he loved, the faith family, that multicultural, multi-generational, multi-socioeconomic faith family that was so alive at Corinth is now struggling. And they're struggling because in his opinion, in a biblical opinion, they've fallen back into slavery, back into chains where the Holy Spirit had previously set them free, and they've forgotten. And so this faith family had gotten sucked back into this lifestyle that felt obedient and kind of underneath this oppressive financial, not financial, but like religious system. I said, you have to follow these 400 plus commandments, and if you follow those 400 plus commandments, then God will accept you and will love you. And they're stuck in that space. As I was reflecting on this, it's so easy for us, I think, family, to look back and to think that Paul, the Apostle Paul, wasn't writing to us. But in reflection on this letter, you see, Paul, Paul had previously in his life, this Apostle Paul, who wrote a big chunk of our New Testament, including the book of 2 Corinthians, which really probably should be 4th Corinthians, because there's a bunch of letters that we don't have in between. But in this letter, the Apostle Paul, Paul had spent previously in his life, had spent his time ridiculously persecuting those who fell outside of the religious system box, those followers of Jesus. And he had persecuted Peter. He had chased down James. He had done all that work. And he had stoned and participated in the stoning of Stephen, who was a good man. Paul was a full-on zealot for the religious system. He had killed people, arrested people, put people in prison, ruined their lives, their economies, taken their businesses. He had done all that. Yet there was a moment for Paul, which made me think about my own moment. Maybe it'll think about your own moment. Maybe you haven't had that moment, which I pray for today. Paul is walking along the road, along another journey. And that night, his name was Saul at that point. And all of a sudden, 
love incarnate Jesus just shows up. And he has this incredible conversion experience. And in the middle of that, he falls to his knees, overwhelmed by the presence of God. Overwhelmed by the presence of God. He gets on his knees, he gets on his face, and he's just, he cannot move. And all of a sudden, Jesus says to him, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Why are you chasing me? And he has this moment. Everything we're about to say about freedom has to be based on that moment, because it was in that moment that Paul realized how much God loved him. He was trying to pull Paul into more of who Paul could be. He was trying to help convert Paul into more of who Paul could be. He was trying to help Paul. He wasn't angry at Paul. He wasn't upset at Paul. He didn't ride down on some kind of big golden chariot with, a, with an axe to get Paul. He was there to love Paul. Have you had a moment? Because we really can't talk about freedom yet, and we're going to get there. And though you've had your moment when you realize that the love of God is real, that God loves you, absolutely nothing that you can do about it. No matter how far you go, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, past, present, future, you can't turn up that dial, you can't turn down that dial. That the love of God is relentless for you, it's coming for you, it can absolutely overwhelm and destroy who you think you are in all the right ways, amen? Have you had that moment? Where you realize that God, the God of the universe, the God that created everything from beginning to end, absolutely adores you. Your picture is on God's fridge. You all get that? And so Paul is in that room with that dark candle with a body that's been broken down, full of weakness and really a lot of suffering, but he's on fire. Because he knows that what he's about to write is so true. So he writes to the church, Corinth, he says, family, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. He writes previously in Galatians, don't be yoked again by slavery. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. He writes a little bit later in that same letter to a different church. He says, you're called to be free. Now don't use your freedom for wild things. Use your freedom to love your neighbor fully. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And so he writes it, and he gets one chance, and he writes it in the perfect Greek that Paul already used. And later he signs that letter, and he sends it. And I think he sends it to me. And he sends it to you. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. See, the church in Corinth had got lost in their own trying to live up to religious standards. We do some of that. Like, I get that. We get lost in our own religious standards and try to, hey, don't drink, don't smoke, don't have sex before you're married. Do the right things at all times. We get lost in the do's and the don'ts, but not fully. See, I think our shackles are different. Our shackles are for our age, and I think Paul would write the same thing. He said, look, first bread's family, Jake, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You're not free. We are shackled and chained, so many of us, to so many different things. <laughs> Just to begin thinking about that for me, how many of you are able to turn your phone off for 24 hours? Right? How many are not? Right? We're shackled to what might happen at work. We're shackled to what might happen. We're shackled to people's. I'm shackled, you know, like just for me personally, that's a real challenge, right? I am absolutely shackled to people's opinions of me. Anybody else? Just think through the stuff that you're shackled to that traps you. Why do I dress the way I dress? Why do I do the things I do? Why don't I say the things that I say? I am absolutely shackled to people's image of myself. What people think of me, their perceptions of me. So many of us are shackled to our workplace. We absolutely can't stand our jobs. We're being abused on a daily basis, yet we can't possibly leave those workplaces because then we won't have the American dream that we're also shackled to. It says we have to have a house, two car garage, maybe a vacation home. And so we work slavishly at jobs. We overwork. We don't take Sabbath. We work on the weekends. We work 70 hours, 80 hours. We don't enjoy the creation that God has made because we're shackled to a vision of what our life is supposed to be that we've been fed from marketers for years. 
We're shackled to it here today, to an economic system that makes us completely buy and buy and buy and buy, to a political system that says you must be shackled to one party or the other party or have this cause or this thing, and that becomes our life and our world, and you label yourself as progressive or conservative, liberal, Democrat, Republican. We're shackled to these images so we can't hear another opinion anymore, that Jesus can't speak truth to that. Oh, brothers and sisters, we are shackled in here today. We are not free. I'm a parent. Oftentimes I'm shackled, if I'm really honest, about my own reflection to my kids. Why am I so upset if my son does not perform well at seven-year-old soccer? Is someone really judging me with that? Or am I simply living through my child? And that how he does affects how I am. Right, where, where is my identity wrapped up in as a parent? Where's my identity wrapped in as a husband? Am I so shackled to that man or to that woman that I can't get free of that? That if they are having a bad day with me, if they don't like me, I feel bad about myself? The church at Corinth was shackled to an old religious system that Jesus had come to destroy. We are shackled to our own religious systems today our political systems and our economic systems, we don't sit in here free. And so Paul writes with the same heart that I would write and say, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I don't want anybody to leave here today feeling shackled to anything. I want you to be free as free can be, that God intended for you is freedom. Paul is right. He knows Jesus. He knows that overwhelming love. He knows all that. Brothers and sisters, so many of us are shackled to our own addictions. Addiction to power, money, sex. Oh, it's everywhere in this space, brothers and sisters. And the Holy Spirit says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. That's what I want for us today, freedom. Freedom, freedom, freedom as you leave this place. There's a couple quotes I want to share that I think are super important. The, the, the Bible has funny words in it, amen? Right? Like, amen. What does that word even mean? Right? One of those words is idolatry. Idolatry is the reality that all of us have a choice. We have this soul. Maybe just put like a, like a vision of a soul in your hand. Like just my soul in my hand right here, my heartbeat, who I am as a person. And you have a choice on where to put this. And who to give it to. All times you have a choice on where to put this and who to give it to. And if you give it to anything but Jesus. It's not a quick shackle. It's not a quick prison. But little by little your soul becomes captured. And the weight gets added to like a chain on your leg. And all of a sudden you're dragging it around. <laughs> And life is not what it's meant to be. Here's how I know. We have this thing on, on staff development days um, where we go and we spend three hours just really by ourselves kind of reflecting with Jesus. And when I'm done with that time, when I'm done spending time in the presence of God, when I'm done spending time with Jesus, and I walk out of that space, brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, I know what freedom feels like. The language I use is like, I am really dangerous right now because I might just say anything, right? Because I realize that God so desperately loves me and that I am found in him, that I don't need anybody else's opinion of me. That's a dangerous, beautiful, wonderful place to be, and that's what I want for us. We have this thing. Tim Keller has the best definition of idolatry. I want to read it. What is an idol? It's anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. Anything you seek to give you what only God can give. An idol is whatever you look at and say in your heart of hearts, if I just had that, then I'll feel like my life has meaning. Then I'll know I have value. Then I'll feel sinful given and secure. 
Whatever you look at and say in your heart of hearts, if I just had this much more money in my bank account, if my kids were just this way, if my health was just this way, if my work was just this way, if my house was just this way, if I had that, then I would be... That's taking your soul and giving it to another. There are many ways to describe that kind of relationship to something, but perhaps the best one is worship. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, Paul writes in that room, there is freedom. Anything else, anything else, family, will capture you, shackle you, and hold you down. Paul knew it. He wrote it, not only to the church at Corinth, but to us as first Christ. From Richard Rohr. If I had to summarize the social teaching of Jesus in one phrase, it's the doctrine of non-idolatry. Don't idolize anything. Your marriage, your children, they're eventually going to be taken from you. No form of government, no school of economics, no army, no cause, no country will ever be worth your whole soul. Nothing will ever be worth it. Do not give it to anything else. Serve God's world, but worship nothing. Serve God's world, but worship nothing in it. It's about as radical as you can get. Everything on earth is passing away. Spirituality is always about letting go. That's the rich, ultimate meaning of the word forgiving. Handing it over before it's taken from us. There's no more radical teaching than the kingdom. And that word kingdom simply means to live and absorb the love of God on an every second basis. Kingdom demands, we recognize that all is passing away. It is the gate to perfect freedom in the kingdom, in the love of God, as it absorbs us and we experience that in our deep relationship with Jesus as we live in the reign of God. In that space, Serving God and God only, not serving country, not serving party, not serving church, not serving Presbyterian versus Methodist versus new worshiping community versus whatever. As we live in that place, bending a knee to one and one only, Jesus, going where he says to go, doing what he says to do. You'll find yourself possibly like Paul. It doesn't mean glory. One of the problems with Paul is that the church was going like, we don't want to um, live like that, Paul. You look a little beat up. The churches say that, don't they? Paul says, no, you don't get it. I'm on fire. I'm free. It's the gate to perfect freedom in the kingdom we're free for God, free for truth. Gosh, brothers and sisters, as a dream, couldn't we be kingdom people? No matter where God has put you, to bring that, that's what it's talking about, salt of the earth. That's what it's talking about, to season every place that you're in, to live free. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Ask yourself, are you free? Are you trapped and shackled in some way, shape, or form? Are you free to let the love of God overwhelm you and consume you and power you? Or are you trapped in a world of worry, in a world of anxiety, in a world of control? The great quote that says, the opposite of faith is not doubt. The opposite of faith is control. You saying, God, I don't trust that you love me fully. I don't trust that you know what's best for me. So I'm going to take it back. Shackled. Here's what I want to do today. I want to talk about freedom. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I want us to leave this place as free as we can possibly, and I do think we need a daily reminder, amen, 
a daily reminder, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Not shame, not guilt, not condemnation. Who here is this excellent besides me at beating themselves up? Right? Who here, whose harshest critic in the room is themselves? Right? Join me on the crusade to stop beating ourselves up. God loves me. God thinks I'm amazing and fantastic and thinks you're amazing and fantastic just the way you are. Stop. The Spirit of the Lord is there is freedom. So many of you in this space right now are like, oh, I'm shackled. I've failed again. I want you to hear the Spirit of the Lord say, I love you. You are not. You're not failing. You're human. How do we experience this freedom? How do we get there, Pastor Jake? What's the... Here's how. You have to completely and utterly submit and surrender to where the freedom is. What does it say as Paul wrote it? Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You have to chase it and submit to it and surrender to it. And I want to give you a picture that as you do that work, the Holy Spirit will take you and will transform you and move you into more and more freedom as a daily basis. If you let the Holy Spirit do that work, that's what's going to happen. No matter where you've been or what you've done, it's going to pull you into freedom. It's going to move you towards freedom. That's why Paul is writing it because that's what Paul has experienced. That's what I've experienced. That's what many of you have experienced. That along the way, the Holy Spirit pulls us into freedom. And that freedom looks exactly like what we see Jesus teaching about in the Sermon on the Mount, it doesn't look like freedom that says I can do whatever I want to. It looks like freedom that says I'm going to make you into who I intended for you to be. I'm going to carve you into the freedom that I created you for. It's not freedom to go do whatever you want in the world. It's freedom to love well. You are set free for a purpose. You can't love well if you're loving so that somebody else likes you. That's not even love in the first place, by the way. That's manipulation. If I'm loving you and serving you and caring for you because I hope you say something nice about me, that's not love anymore. That's transactional. Y'all see that? The way that Jesus loves, the agape love, is the freedom to love. I don't need you to respond. I am free to love you for you. I am free to love you right where you are for you. I don't need you to turn around and give me something. I don't need to turn around and get you to like me. I am free, as free can be, to love you right there. The only way to get to that place is to let the Holy Spirit do the Holy Spirit's work in you. Amen? It's our job, simply our job, to surrender to that process and to chase it down. Holy Spirit, what are you doing? Teach me, train me, move me. And I want to give you a picture, not of commandments, but of description. That someone who's completely free to live in God's love, to live in the kingdom, the reign of God, will look like Jesus' picture in the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is a picture, a description, not a commandment or a, or a descriptive, like not a commandment or something to be obedient to. It's a picture of what it looks like as you allow the Holy Spirit to change you and transform you. You can walk the extra mile because you need that. You don't need to do that. You, sorry, you can walk the extra mile with an enemy or with a Roman soldier because you don't need them to like you. You can just love freely that way. You can turn the other cheek because you know that God's going to take care of it. You can give your cloak. You can forgive because God's got you. Your identity is built in there. That's where the freedom's going to pull you. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Whew. Free. Today, what I want us to do is many of us, have, maybe you've never experienced, you've never experienced that overwhelming sensation that Paul did on that road where God just overwhelms you with love for you. I want to pray for that today to happen in this space as we continue. Maybe for some of you that's happened, but you've forgotten. You've kind of gotten back into shackles. 
You're shackled to your work. You can't take a Sabbath. You're shackled to your own identity. You have to get people to like you on a constant basis. You're shackled to all the different idols that our world provides, from materials to consumerism to money to sex to power to control to worry. You're shackled. God wants you to be free today. Holy Spirit wants you to be free today. You might need someone to pray with. You might need to come up here to the altar and just pray and lay those things down. You might need to take that soul piece of you that you've been giving to something else, your workplace, your image, whatever it is. You might need to lay it down on this altar and say, Jesus, this was meant for you. You might need to chase where the spirit of the Lord is. There is freedom. You might need to find yourself in the presence of God. Three quick thoughts. One, a lot of keys to freedom. Prayer frees us to be with God. Giving. Sacrificial. I don't mean to the church. I mean everywhere. Giving in all the different ways, shapes, and forms frees us from the materials of this world. And fasting, as we've talked about, frees us from ourselves. Chase to surrender, to submit to the Holy Spirit's work. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Don't be shackled, fam. Don't be shackled anymore. You're going to get a chance to pray with some prayer, with some prayer team members up here, to pray with myself, to come lay it down on the altar. Um, we're going to celebrate communion. As we celebrate communion together, this is the work that Jesus did, and you could hear him say it in Luke 4. He's kind of in that synagogue for the first time, and he says, I have come, the Father has sent me for the release of the prisoners. For freedom. And God knows all over and over and over again that we're going to reshackle, we're going to rechain, we're going to put ourselves back in prison. And that Jesus, and this we celebrate, that Jesus paid the price in his death and his resurrection so that we could be free. Christ, <laughs> it's for freedom that Christ died and rose again. Do not be yoked again to slavery. So as you come to the table, my heartbeat is that you would come to this table and all are welcome to the table. If you're helping me serve, coming up here around the sides, that all are welcome at this table. All are welcome at this table. Servers coming up here around the sides, that'd be great. As you come to the table this morning, make it a space that as you come, that you're saying to Jesus, I want to be free. Holy Spirit, change me, transform me, allow me to submit to this and to surrender to this because I believe that what Paul, our brother, wrote in that room where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Amen? There's going to be people up here to pray with, too. If you just feel spiritually stuck, there's an addiction, there's an idol, there's a block, there's a thought, there's a relationship that just is stopping you from experiencing the freedom that Jesus intended. I'm going to be up here to pray. Mary is going to be up here to pray. Mary, raise your hand. We want to pray with you. And if you just need a moment up here, kind of on the stairs, physically near the altar, to lay down the, the, the stuff that has shackled you with Jesus, that space is open too. We want to create this space in this next period of time where we can just do Holy Spirit ministry together. Amen? On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he sat with his friends, his brothers and his sisters. He knew what he was about to do. He knew what the cost of freedom was going to be. He took a piece of bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. This is my body that I have my agape love for you. I'm giving up so that you can be free. And I'm giving up as a model what it looks like to become fully loved. He took a cup and he poured it. He said, this is my blood 
spilled out for you in a new covenant, in a new way. Like when you decide to follow me, the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And if you let the Holy Spirit do the Holy Spirit's work, the Spirit of Jesus, it will drag you into freedom. It's a new covenant. You can't earn it. You can't achieve it. It is already done. He said when you take and when you eat and you pass it around, eat and drink and remember this table of freedom. Remember that I am always with you. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Let me pray. Holy Spirit, I am just a man. Just a man with a reflection on what your servant Paul was writing and what it meant to me. Holy Spirit, you're going to find me right up here. I want to pray you would do the work among us this morning. We are free. Of all the things we chase that encapture us, and keep us in prison. Your scripture calls them idols. I'm praying that we would let them all down. We would burn them all down. We would lay them all down. As Paul writes with his heart broken for his faith family, it says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I'm praying that every single one of us will leave this place in freedom, laying it all down right here. Holy Spirit, do the ministry among us as you set us free to love well, without agenda, without manipulation, to love those in the places you put us as kingdom people, worshiping nothing but you, but serving your world with joy and grace and mercy as you've taught us. Praise these things in your name. Amen.